Life is full of paradoxes. A paradox is a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement that's true. I'll give you an example. Spring in the upper Midwest. <laughs> the average temperature should be 65 degrees, but it's never 65 degrees. It's 80 degrees or it's 50 degrees. It's a paradox. In the spring of 2019, we here in Sioux Falls were having a classic spring day, a horrible mix of rain and snow pelting down on top of a few feet of frozen snowpack. The ice rink in the back of our house, formerly known as our yard, was so frozen over that all the water was flowing into the back of our house. And in the cold and pouring rain, my husband saved our house from even more flooding by hacking a trench through the snowpack that had a winter's worth of dog poop embedded in it. <laughs> and while all the water was breaking into our house, I was inside, stressing and hoping and praying for a different kind of water to break. I was extremely pregnant at the time. I was nine days past my due date. And even after all the stress of that day and all the raspberry tea and castor oil cocktails, I could not get my labor going. But to be honest, I wasn't that surprised because I'd been doing an experiment on myself. During this pregnancy, I had taken a lot of fish oil, um, and my hypothesis was that I would go at least to full term. So let me back up. I'm a nutrition researcher and a registered dietitian, and I study omega-3 fatty acids that are found in fish and fish oil. And my research has focused on how omega-3s support healthy, full-term pregnancies. So like every good scientist, I decided to test it out on myself. And it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so after another full day of waiting, I finally decided to go to the hospital, and long story short, I was able to follow through with my birth plan, which ironically was a water birth. <laughs> and I will not be sharing a picture of that water-based experience with you today. <laughs> But here I am with my little Pisces water baby, happy and healthy. The experiment was a success. But now I have committed the cardinal sin of scientific communications by sharing a personal anecdote as scientific evidence. But you all will remember my single birth story more than the studies that I'll present that include literally thousands of women. So go figure. <laughs> and while I love a detailed story from a stranger as much as the next person and unrequested baby photos, <laughs> today I want to talk about the other end of the spectrum, which is going into labor too soon, also known as preterm birth. So before we go any further, here are some definitions. A full-term pregnancy lasts somewhere between 37 and 42 weeks gestation, ideally lasting until at least 39 weeks. Preterm birth is giving birth before 37 weeks gestation, and early preterm birth is before 34 weeks. And figuring out how to make pregnancies last past at least 34 weeks is a really important public health issue. And I'll tell you three reasons why. The first, preterm birth complications are the leading cause of death in children under the age of five in the U.S. and worldwide. Number two, the consequences, or the earlier the birth, the more severe the consequences. Early preterm babies typically can't do basic physiological functions like breathing on their own. Without massive interventions, most would die. Thankfully, in the U.S., we have um, gotten very good at treating early preterm babies so that the death rate is less than 10%. But massive interventions have a cost, and preterm birth, uh, pre births on average cost $50,000 more than an uncomplicated birth. There's also long-term consequences to prematurity, like learning behavioral and visual issues. So especially in the early preterm birth period, every extra day in the womb is incredibly important. Number three, preterm birth rates have increased over the last decade. Our rate in the U.S. last year was 10.5% of all births, which is more than one in 10 births. Of those, about 2% were early preterm births. And as a comparison, Norway's preterm birth rate is about 5.6%. Women of color tend to have higher rates than white women, and these statistics, coupled with a horrifying increase in maternal mortality rate, show just how much needs to change to make pregnancy safer and healthier for all women. 
and yet there are no specific biomarkers that can predict who will have preterm birth, and risk factors are vague or non-modifiable. And so for prevention, there's not much there either. You can, if needed, have your cervix sewn up, or you can be given steroids to have the lungs of the fetus develop faster. And there was one drug on the market, but it was recently taken off by the Food and Drug Administration but it, because it wasn't effective at actually delaying labor. But what if I told you something as simple as eating fish and seafood a couple times a week could lower the rates of early preterm birth? You've probably heard, though, that fish and seafood are dangerous in pregnancy. So we finally arrived at the fish paradox. Fish and seafood are full of nutrients that are so important for the fetus, and one such nutrient is called DHA, or docosa hexanoic acid. It's a specific kind of omega-3 fatty acid that's critical for brain and eye development, and unfortunately is only found in fish and seafood. Humans have the ability to make DHA from other omega-3s in their body, but it's fairly inefficient, so it's really important to get it from the diet. So in the slightly edited words of Ariel from The Little Mermaid, I don't understand how a food with such wonderful nutrients could be bad. <laughs> Everyone knows the word is mercury. Fish and seafood do contain mercury, a neurotoxin that can negatively affect the brain development of a growing fetus. Fish are not naturally high in mercury, but coal-fired power plants pollute the air and water so that then the mercury builds up in the fish. And the bigger the fish, the longer they live in that water, the higher their mercury is. Without this pollution, fish and seafood wouldn't be rich in mercury. But, and this paradox wouldn't exist. But here we are. So to better understand why we have a fish paradox, let's go take a trip to a tiny group of islands in the North Atlantic Ocean called the Faroe Islands. As you can see, this is a magical place, but it's not great for farming. So the traditional diet here is very, very rich in seafood. And because of this unique diet, the people of these islands have been studied to better understand what eating lots of fish and seafood does for health, particularly pregnancy. From these islands, two strands of paradoxical research have emerged, and they have contradictory results. One says seafood is good for pregnancy, and one says seafood is bad for pregnancy. So first, let's take a look at the bad for pregnancy side of the story. In 1997, researchers from the Odense University in Denmark observed that pregnant women who ate high amounts of pilot whale blubber, which is a traditional food in the Faroe Islands, uh, their children had significant cognitive deficits. But here's the catch. Pilot whale blubber has at least 20 times the mercury content of other fish and seafood. So from this data, and out of an abundance of caution, the FDA and the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, in 2001, put out an advisory to women who may become pregnant, or who were pregnant, that they should limit their intake of non-commercial fish to one serving a week. So they were concerned that fish that were caught instead of bought um, would have higher levels of mercury from undetected waterway contaminations. This very limited advisory stirred up a lot of fear, and suddenly the message to the public turned into, all fish are poison. <laughs> and after this advisory went out, intake of all fish and seafood decreased in pregnant women, according to research by Dr. Oaken of Harvard. So much so that in 2004, the FDA and EPA updated their advisory, trying to encourage women to eat fish for pregnancy, but also telling them to avoid a handful of certain high-mercury fish, like shark and swordfish, and to still be cautious with non-commercial fish. But that ship had sailed, even though a vast majority of the commercially available fish in the U.S. is very low in mercury most women still chose to avoid it. And to demonstrate just how low in mercury most fish are, allow me to provide some examples. Let's start with the most commonly eaten risky fish with regards to mercury, albacore or white-canned tuna. The current recommendation is to eat this kind of tuna 
just once a week if you're pregnant. But one would need to eat 3.5 pounds of tuna per week to reach risky levels of mercury intake. That's about 28 individual cans of tuna. <laughs> and it's too much tuna. This is nothing compared to the 53 pounds of salmon you would need to eat every week to reach risky levels of mercury intake. So I know what you're thinking. What about the bears? <laughs> Forget cocaine bear, now I have to worry about mercury bear? <laughs> you are all also probably wondering about sushi because it's by far the best way to eat fish. And sushi is often avoided both because it's fish and because it's raw. So the raw part gives it an increased risk for food poisoning. So it's still on the restricted list. And this concludes the end of my fish public service announcement. <laughs> Now let's talk about the fish are good for pregnancy side of the research. In 1985, Dr. Olson from the Staten Serum Institute in Denmark found that women on the islands who ate fish and seafood but not whale blubber per se, had pregnancies that lasted longer and had larger babies than those who ate less. And from these observational studies, many randomized controlled clinical trials were run to test whether the fish-based nutrient, DHA, was key to, that, to those healthy full-term pregnancies. And then in 2019, Dr. Middleton of the University of Adelaide compiled 70 of these studies, which included 20,000 pregnancies, where omega-3s had been given as a treatment. They found that women who received the omega-3s instead of the placebo had a reduced risk of early preterm birth by 42%. And here's a big arrow that says 42% to <laughs> emphasize how important that finding is. <laughs> The authors went on to say, a universal strategy of supplementation may be reasonable, although ideally, with more knowledge, this would be targeted to women who would benefit the most. Which leads me to my favorite and final study of this talk. In 2021, Dr. Susan Carlson from the University of Kansas Medical Center published a clinical trial in 1,100 pregnant women testing the effect of two different doses of DHA on early preterm birth rates. Luckily, the research al researchers also measured DHA in the blood of the participants at the beginning of the study, so they were able to use that to analyze the data. So first, let's take a look at the group who had low levels of DHA in their blood at the beginning of the study, termed the DHA-deficient group. In this group, those who received the lower DHA dose had the highest rates of early preterm birth, at 4.1%. But those who received the high dose of DHA saw this rate cut in half to 2%. So let's imagine a clinical setting where the DHA blood level is measured in the office early in pregnancy, thereby identifying the women who would benefit the most. High dose DHA could then be prescribed to raise DHA blood levels and possibly lower the risk for early preterm birth. This would be a game changer. But let's look at the other, the other side of the, of the story. The participants who had higher DHA blood levels at the beginning of the study, or the DHA sufficient group, for them, it didn't matter if they got a high or a low dose of DHA during pregnancy. Their rates were very low across the board, 1.1 and 1.4% for their early preterm birth rates. A higher DHA blood level at the beginning of the study seemed to be more important than the dose that was given during the study. So if the best option is to have higher DHA blood levels before pregnancy starts, then we have to talk about the public health solution, which is simply eat some fish. <laughs> <laughs> Two or three times a week would be great, preferably low mercury, high DHA fish like salmon or trout or tuna. And if you don't eat fish, consider taking a DHA supplement like fish oil or vegan algal oil. And for the purposes of today's talk, this is targeted towards women who are pregnant or of childbearing age, but it's really advice generally for everybody. And I am re-emphasizing these current boring recommendations because I found in my research that eating two or three servings of fish per week over time corresponds to that sufficient DHA blood level that we just learned is associated with lower early preterm birth rates. So that's it. 
Did I just spend my entire TED Talk going over history and regulations and research and islands and bears to come to the grand conclusion that we should all eat some fish? I did. <laughs> but now for the final paradox. DHA is important, but it's just one piece of the puzzle of preterm birth. There are so many other changes that need to be made to make pregnancy safer and healthier for all women, like guaranteed paid maternity leave, for one thing. I believe that we will never regret investing in the health of our mothers and babies because all of our futures literally depend on it. Thank you. <laughs>